been six years now, and we've won lots of cool awards about game stores and best game stores, but we were always waiting for the complete package, and that is the scullery, the sanctuary, and Nightwatch games being sort of the trifecta for uh, geekdom to be empowered. Happy that we're over the big hump. Uh, we survived COVID. Um, strangely, we, we actually did really well through COVID. Uh, many of our peers had a hard time with it, and some of them actually folded. Mm -hmm. But it comes back to that s initial idea of if you make a space in which you empower your community, they will take care of you in times of need. Mm -hmm. um, Hello. Welcome to Freestyle, where we discuss pop culture, business, self-help, gaming, and technology, among other things. We got off script here. Let's freestyle. I'm Justin. I'm joined by True Shot Turtle, my co-host, co and Pork Mulgrew, owner-operator of Nightwatch Games. He, uh, some of his accolades would include, um, let's see here, uh, 2018 Best Overall Game Store in North America from GAMA, 2019 Best Game Store in San Antonio, from SA Current, Best of San Antonio 2020 from Express News. How you guys doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. I'm very well. So, uh, if you could, Pork, tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe um, early life, uh, how you got started into um, owning a game store. Sure. Uh, it's a story I tell a lot. Um, I think it starts with me, uh, a college professor. I was teaching English literature to kids, and it was during the beginning of the two big wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. And I was teaching the kids the lesson of Vietnam literature and some of the stories that have come out of that era. And I was talking about how people were dodging the draft of the Vietnam War by getting into academics, uh, teaching or as a student or something, anything that really just dodged being drafted. And it was at that moment, one of the students, sort of a troublemaker student, uh, said, is that why you're teaching right now, is so that you don't get drafted into the wars? And um, I sort of blew it off. I was 37 at the time, so I was you know, kind of theoretically too old to get into the army anyway. But there was a little kernel of truth to the question is why have I not joined the army or some other uh, armed forces to do my part during this era of discord and this era of um, news flashes where you just see horrible footage of IEDs and, you know, troops that, wouldn't be coming home, uh, that kind of stuff. And I was really into airsoft at the time. Um, you can, I don't know if you have visuals, but behind me, I have a whole collection of airsoft rifles. Uh, so I knew what it was to shoot, move and communicate. And so I naively thought that because I was good at airsoft, that I would obviously be uh, a valuable asset to the army. Uh, totally underestimated what it takes to be in the army, and I totally overestimated uh, my current state of health. Uh, but I joined up. I joined the army at the age of 37, which was, I, I think, uh, somewhat of a mistake. Uh, the second mistake was I joined as an enlisted guy, even though I had my master's degree. Hmm. Uh, and then the third mistake was I joined the infantry. <laughs> so... Huh. Um, way out of my my comfort zone to say the least and uh, I survived that kind of thing for about two to three years and then somebody asked me why I had not commissioned to become an officer and I said well it was never an option that was given to me and they said well yeah your recruiter should have told you about all that and I, you know, I was like well I was just joining up to become you know some special forces guy and they just strung me along <laughs> um there's no way I'm going to be special forces at the age of 37, but it was during the surge. So they were taking everybody. Oh yeah. And, um, 
I guess about, um, yeah, about three years in, I commissioned, I became a military intelligence officer and then uh, bounced around, did some stuff in Africa and in Germany, deployed to Iraq. Uh, then I did some training as a counter intel guy. And then around eight years in, uh, I took a picture of me standing in the Sahara Desert. I took a picture of my boots standing in the sand, and it was easily over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And my wife took a picture at the exact same moment, and she was standing in the Andes Mountains, and she had her winter galoshes on standing in snow. Hmm. And we juxtaposed the two pictures together to sort of basically show that we were really in two different worlds. And hmm. Uh, she and I sort of looked at each other across a, a Zoom meeting, and we said, you know, this is not really the life that we wanted. This isn't why we got married. Uh, the Army life is not really my life as much as I like Airsoft. It's just a far cry from what real Army is like. And uh, so we started looking for an exit strategy for the Army, and we started the discussion of what to do once we got out. And that's always kind of a daunting question because the army gives you a certain number of skills and experiences, but it's hard to translate that into a civilian job. So I thought I was kind of stuck with, you know, the FBI or CIA or uh, Homeland Defense or, you know, Border Patrol, something like that. I thought that was going to be where I had to go, but that was just more of the same. And it was when Brenda said, well, what if we open up that game store that we talk about? I said, well, you know, that's that conversation we have over coffee. And usually the conversation starts with a sentence, if we won a million dollars, this is what we do. And I turned to her, I said, babe, we have not won a million dollars. So <laughs> what are you talking about? And she said, well, she's got a lot of business acumen from being a high executive restaurant manager for Bill Miller's Barbecue, which is a huge barbecue chain down in uh, Texas, mostly in San Antonio. And she was working for the owners as their personal assistant. So she knew what it was to run large scale businesses. And I had been a board gamer and strategy gamer and a card gamer most of my life. Uh, so I knew what it was that gamers wanted in a game store. And so she said, you know, with our two powers combined, uh, we could really pull this off. And um, one, I was totally stunned that I had a wife that was willing to give up the security of a government job for entrepreneurship. Wow. Uh, huge risks. You know, entrepreneurship is, is really kind of a scary thing, especially uh, with uh, the, you know, the economy the way it is now. And If you have children. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we... We had, through our discussions, a very vivid idea of what our game store would look like if we were to make one. And we also realized that to start that whole thing, we had to go all in. There was no foot in the water. It was, you're jumping into the deep end. And so we really liquidated all our savings and we took out a huge loan from a bank and we opened up this game store we called it Night Watch Games, and we decorated the inside of it so it looks like a medieval keep. Right, I've like got a, pictures a large... of it right now. I'm showing it off. Yeah, cool. Um, it's it's a it's sort of a big tavern kind of feel to it, and because we liquidated everything that we had, we had to decorate this place with things that we owned. So a lot of my game room accoutrements sort of went into the store. So the weapons on the wall, the suits of armor, uh, the plaques of a dragon head, and uh, all my Magic the Gathering inventory, the rugs, the table, a lot of things from my house went into the store mm -hmm. so that we could furnish it the way I wanted it and also cut costs. And the end result was that the store becomes very homey. Uh, right. When you walk into Nightwatch games, it feels like you're walking into you know, a gamer's house and it's decorated the way they would want. And what I've discovered is my ideal game store is a vision shared by a lot of other people. Hmm. And the industry is such that um, for some reason, game stores didn't really capitalize on that kind of thing. They thought that as long as you were providing plastic tables 
in plastic chairs that you were doing okay. Huh. Yeah, I'm showing and pictures it, of your tables right now. That's definitely not yeah. an issue in your store. No, those are all handcrafted because uh, we knew um, that uh, that was the one, the look and the feel that we wanted, but we also knew that nobody was making those tables uh, in any kind of affordable way. So we, we went to town and uh, made those ourselves. And I was always questioning all the other game stores that I'd gone to previously. Why did they not do more with the space that they had? And I never really got a good answer. And maybe it's finances because, you know, decking out a store to make it look cool does take a little bit of money. Yeah. That, and it, passion too. You got to want it. Like you said, you li you practically live here. Like this is a second yeah, home for yeah. you. Uh, and I can see, I can see the care and the amount of attention that you, uh, put into this. I, I guarantee your hearts in this too. Absolutely. And I think that might be the difference is that my peers, and I certainly don't speak for a hundred percent of them. There are some really great stores out there with really good owners, but a majority of the stores don't seem to really have that passion. They seem to be in the industry as a, a retailer, a person that just wants to sell games to people. And that's sort of their path to uh, prosperity. But I, I think the industry has moved past that kind of relationship where a customer is demanding or deserves more than just a buyer seller relationship. You know, right. Amazon will beat us on that avenue every time. There's no way that I could be in business doing the same thing that Amazon does, hoping that I'm going to win that war. There's right. no way. So I have to provide something that Amazon is not providing. And that is that environment that legitimizes gamers in all different forms. Uh, everything non-electronic, I should say. Yeah, uh, We don't do anything kind of electronic. Um, but when you walk into Nightwatch Games, you feel legitimized in this very niche passion that you have whether it be role-playing games, dice games, card games, uh, strategy games, war games, all that stuff um, is bona fide when you walk into the store and you see that this space is designed specifically for you. And it mm -hmm. minimizes the fact that I sell games and it maximizes that you enjoy them. And what we find is there's a community that rallies behind that approach and they really become super loyal to what Nightwatch Games is doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they buy their games from us, even though we can't compete with Amazon. Uh, we do offer, you know, in-store expertise, uh, the tournaments, uh, the fact that you can get it immediately off our shelf. Uh, and then we provide a whole community in which you can play the games with. So there's very little that you end up walking away needing. We, we provide all of that for you. I took a look at your calendar. Um, I noticed you have a lot of events, too, throughout the month. We do. Um, and we don't really necessarily organize that on the store level. That's really events that are organized from the community. And the community reaches out to us saying, hey, we'd like to host uh, Star Wars Legion tournaments every other Sunday. Can you guys host us? And, of course, we're totally on board with that kind of thing. Uh, one of the few events that we do host is Ladies' Night Out. Every other Thursday, my wife hosts a ladies-only gaming night in which she has multiple coaches teach pods of ladies how to play various games. And they treat it like a big party. You know, there's, there's cakes and cookies and drinks and coffee, and they have the greatest time. And they've totally overtaken the store on every other Thursday. And they're now this empowered demographic that can represent themselves and hold their own at the table. And we realize that if you empower women in a game store, men follow because that's where the women are, right? We, we go where the women are. Um, yeah. So that whole scene has been really, really good for us. And it's, it's awesome to see the San Antonio women's demographic really become empowered and enlivened and connected and, uh, they're doing their own things now, and you don't have to. W when a lady walks into Nightwatch Games, it's not because they're attached to some man. They're independent mm. now. They're they're here to shop. They're here to play. They're here to win, and I think that's just super cool. So Very the cool. scullery that you have set up, um, I, I was looking, and you have lots of stuff there on the menu. Uh, what what 
made you decide to not only turn this game store into a place for gaming, but to hang out and also to feed people. Uh, you, you don't see this very often in game stores. You should, though. Um, I think it's actually the sales model that's got the most promise. And that is when you offer a community space that's attached to a retail space, what you really want to do is create a sense of well-being, of safety, of belonging, and of uh, understanding. And so you provide all that, but there's the basic economics of it. If people hang out in a place, they're more likely to spend money in that place. Mm -hmm. And so the best way to get people to hang out in your space outside of making it safe and fun and immersive and all the things that we had already done is to provide them food and drinks. Um, and if you can eat and drink and you've got a bathroom to go to, you could play games all day long. And I guarantee if you're playing games all day long in a store, you're probably going to spend some money there um, at the shelves. And so it's really a way of bolstering the relationship between us and the community, giving them what we call the third place. Uh, you have your home, which is your first place. You have work is your second place. And then you have this third place. A lot of people have bars that they go to or dance clubs that they go to. Some people go to the library. Well, we're that third place for a lot of people where if they're not working and if they're not home, they're at night watch games hanging out. And so food and drink was really something that we had wanted to do ever since we opened the doors. And the reason why we didn't is because we have two large wolf dogs that come to work with us every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would hang out in the store and they're super docile. They just really kind of lay around and sort of get in people's way by being this big breathing rug. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but we couldn't serve food. We couldn't even store food on the premises because we had animals and the mm -hmm. food, the food and health administration would come down on us pretty heavily if we even tried. So uh, we sort of thought, well, we'll wait until the dogs die. You know, it's not something that we want to happen, but it will happen. And so we were holding our breath for that event. Um, and then a couple of things happened that really put us on the fast track is the suite next door to Nightwatch Games became available to lease. Mm. And what that did was allow us to move our office from Nightwatch Games over to the new suite, to bring the dogs over to the new suite, and also to expand on our live action role-playing uh, medieval renaissance inventory. It's all the weapons and armor and garb that you would associate with renaissance fairs. And that became its own store, and we called that the Sanctuary. And now that the dogs were outside of Nightwatch Games, we could go and open up that cafe. And we called the cafe the Scullery because it was sort of, you know, on brand, some medieval dark hole back in the, the end of the castle where the food was prepared. Um, and we had this real small kind of space to make this kitchen out of. And I have to say that we're really proud of what we've done with that small space. And Brenda's restaurant tour experience has really come on. And she is back into her element of slinging plates around and making things happen. Um, and so I think we're sort of at the end of our developmental road. It's It's been six years now. And we've won lots of cool awards about game stores and best game stores, but we were always waiting for the complete package. And that is the scullery, the sanctuary, and Nightwatch games being sort of the trifecta for uh, geekdom to be empowered. And that's where we are. So I'm, I'm sort of happy that we're over the big hump. Uh, we survived COVID. Um, strangely, we, we actually did really well through COVID uh, many of our peers had a hard time with it, and some of them actually folded. Mm -hmm. But it comes back to that s initial idea. Of if you make a space in which you empower your community, they will take care of you in times of need. Mm -hmm. um, Gary Vaynerchuk, who's this entrepreneur and kind of uh, guest speaker or in inspirational speaker, he talks about a philosophy of punch, punch, or no, he calls it jab, 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 right hook. And that's the idea that you offer value up front 
over and over and over again without asking anything in return. And then when you're in need, you ask a favor and people have been given values for so long that they feel indebted to you and they come through and they help you out. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what happened with Nightwatch Games is we gave a lot of value up front, you know, the, the store itself, the space. We don't charge for play space. We don't charge for the ambience. We don't charge for the demo wall that you can use. Uh, there was a lot of value given up front. Uh, and then when COVID came by and we were in trouble, we asked for that favor. Hmm. When you're going to shop during the COVID crisis, as easy as it is for you to shop on Amazon, if you could just consider Nightwatch Games to be a place to shop as well. And we'll do curbside service or we'll ship it out to you or we'll do what we can to get you the game. But just consider us in this time. And boy, did our community come out in droves. Mm. They were sending us money and we would ask them, what what is it that you're buying? You just sent us $100, but you didn't tell me what you're buying. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I'm not buying anything. Wow. I'm just sending you $100. Um, it wow. was amazing. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> so we we actually sailed through COVID uh, pretty easily. And with the money that we were able to get during that time, that helped us open up uh, the sanctuary and get our medieval garb and our inventory up to speed. And uh, so speaking of inventory, been... I'm telling you, you guys store yeah. is huge. I'm looking just uh, it's, I got over 100 pages here of uh yeah. of items uh and and we're t and there's uh 60 60 results per page so that's a lot of inventory you guys are keeping up with yeah i think we have um recently in the the recent years we have over a hundred thousand dollars worth of inventory and that's at nightwatch games only that's not counting the huge suits of armor and the weapons and the garb over at the sanctuary so yeah, we have a lot of stuff. Are you guys getting that uh, that stuff, the, the sanctuary? Uh, do you have people that are that makers that help with some of that that make some stuff for you guys? Um, actually, we, we don't. Uh, what what we technically are are resellers, mm -hmm. and yeah. we're a far cry from say the Halloween store, the spirit stores that you guys see show up around Halloween with that kind of cheapy Halloween outfits. Uh, these are legitimate medieval and Renaissance clothing and armor uh, generally made in Europe. Uh, we have some distributors out of Germany, Lithuania, Spain, Italy. Uh, there's some in Canada. Um, and then there's some U.S. ones. But we basically look at all these other distributors that are making this stuff for that kind of culture, and we're bringing it into a brick and mortar store. And we're one of the few places that actually do that in the States. Uh, that's a very European thing to do is to shop for your medieval stuff within brick and mortar stores. In the States, you usually have to go to a Renaissance fair to get that stuff. And one of the reasons why we don't have handcrafted items in our store is because uh, the person that's handcrafting them can't generate them at the speed in which we sell them. Right. So mm -hmm. as much as we want homegrown effects in our store, like, a, you know, a handmade knife or a hand knitted sweater or something like that. If we sell it, we have to wait months and months before we can get a replacement. And it's it makes business very difficult. So we try to consign some stuff uh, with people that we know. And we sort of have these one-time sales for these unique items. But it's not an everyday item that I can promise you is going to be on our shelf because the person making it is going to you know take so long to make it. So I noticed uh, you're you were building a, a tabletop game uh, some, for wargaming, uh, like Modern Warfare, and I was looking at some of your templates or your or your, your game uh, pieces. I noticed that they were three D printed, uh, and you were so. Do you have do you own three D printers? Do you like three D printing? Uh, 
No, it, it was actually something that we thought about doing for the store where we were thinking of bringing some 3D printing machines in so that we could print game components or terrain or even the miniatures that are being made. Um, and a couple of things stopped us from doing that. One was the, the cost of miniatures went down and the quality of miniatures went up. And so it was very easy for us to sell miniatures from marketers. Uh, the big one is WizKids. And they you you can get two miniatures from WizKids for $5, which is, at, at the time, was an unheard of price. It was an amazing price. And 3D printing was still kind of new for us. So we kind of pumped the brakes on that to see how the market was going to develop. And one of our competitors opened a store. Uh, it's actually called the Printed Meeple. Uh, really good guys. And their store model is half of the store is basically 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And they will 3D print all sorts of files for you. And so we sort of stepped back and we wanted to see how they were doing. And the other thing that Nightwatch Games is known for is we really don't like replicating somebody else's efforts. If somebody is out there doing something and they're doing it well, we're going to step away from that and let them sort of, you know, dominate that market. And we're going to try to satisfy demands that are not being answered. Right. Mm. And so that 3D printing demand was being answered already. Well, in your local course, market, not you weren't like just locally. That's all you were concerned with. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. I, I have to say our, our vision is very uh, microcosm. But we're sort of really about San Antonio. Uh, and while that's a huge city, I think there's 1.6 million people here. Um, it's still got a very small town feel to it, a very small town uh, approach. And so a lot of our business decisions are very much microcosm of Nightwatch games and the immediate vicinity. We really don't have any big designs on getting nationally um, dominant or we're not really trying to franchise or anything. Uh, we don't have any kind of visions of dominance in that regard, but we do like being regarded as being really good at what we do. And so when we won some of those awards from the Gamma Association, which is the uh, Gamers Manufacturers Association, it's sort of like a our lobbying, ruling policy body kind of thing. It's like our political body. Yeah, I looked them up. Um, yeah. They uh, they do this every year where they showcase stores that are doing things really well. And when we won that, uh, we had a lot of people follow up saying, hey, we'd love to franchise. You know, could you come out to San Francisco or New York or whatever? And we realized as much as we like the idea of it, um, a lot of the success of Nightwatch Games derives really from Brenda and I being in the store and what we personally bring to the relationships with our customers. And it's really hard to replicate that. It's, it's, it's hard, hard to replicate to, care yeah. to care about yeah. a place. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and a lot of my peers are just in it for the money. And the, the sad part is there's not a lot of money in this industry. That's, that's not the best way to get rich if that's what you're trying to do. So um, they tend to be jaded and a little frustrating and, uh, short-sighted and again they're not they're not really giving they're, they're doing a lot of taking you're and building a lot of a healthy way to do right you're building a lot of relationships with people too that's you can't undervalue yeah. the importance of building relationships with people well let me show you how profound that is um at night watch games and again imagine a, a scene where half the store is community space and the other half is a retail space with shelves and games on it and there's some private rooms that you can rent. We've had multiple birthday parties within the store. And that's sort of predictable. You know, people uh, check out our private rooms and they reserve them for their birthday parties. But then the second thing is we've had bachelorette parties, uh, baby showers. We've had bachelor parties. We've had six different customers get on their knee and propose to their spouse while in the store. Wow. That's really significant. That's, that's huge. A, that's a big moment in somebody's yeah. life and they You're, chose yeah. to do that within the store. And they'll yeah. remember that and they'll want to come back. Yep. They'll 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 yep. 
cherish those memories. Yep. We've hosted two full blown weddings within the store. We really? converted the whole thing into a big banquet hall and we had two weddings. I actually got ordained so that I could uh, help facilitate one of the weddings. So I'm now officially Lord Reverend Mulgrew, which sounds like a paladin to me. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well done. Yeah. I'm coming to you for my next. There you go. Um, and then sort of to bring that whole thing full circle to show the the impact that we're having on our community, um, the full life cycle is that we've had two memorials as well. Um, fortunately, one of our customers was a suicide and the other one was a casualty of COVID. And their family said, let's celebrate their life in the place that they were happiest. And that was Nightwatch Games. And that has nothing to do with retail. It has nothing to do with me selling people games. It has right. everything to do with relationships and support and understanding and acceptance and empowerment. Uh, I think that's what makes Nightwatch Games unique. Mm -hmm. And I'm really on a crusade to spread that kind of approach to the industry. And I'm now mentoring several other new beginning shops to sort of capture what that power is that your community is going to respond to you way beyond the fact that you sell games and they buy games right when, when money falls to the wayside and civilizations break down what's left is community you know totally totally agree with that yeah so can you can you tell me a little bit about uh maybe future plans you might have uh since you said that you're the building part of it aspect has kind of started to level off. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, Brenda really cringes when that question comes up because I'm the guy with the big ideas. I'm the one with the vision. And whenever I come up with a big idea, it just translates into more work for Brenda. <laughs> so she, she's uh, totally not on board with my big ideas. Um, so yeah, I alluded that we're sort of going to pump the brakes once the scullery really becomes effective and established and we have our staff fully trained on these new duties and everyone is is in this nice copacetic state of operations. Um, I think we're going to sit back and just watch for a little while for probably about six months to a year. But I already have ideas of what I want to do in the future. And that's actually coming back to the airsoft guns that you see behind me is if I could acquire some land, I really want to open up a immersive live action role playing event that instead of focusing on the fantasy and the medieval is we focus on the modern warfare combat of today. And it's the same kind of th thing where you're, you're acting out scenarios and you, adopt roles and you have combat and all this kind of thing. Uh, but I was going to do it with uh, the modern warfare shell. Uh, but I could easily see that that landscape that I would buy into could also be used for medieval LARPing um, and Renaissance fairs and um, do, do a lot of stuff like that. So I sort of want to get into the hosting of large scale events where people immerse themselves in the action. There's a lot of good ideas that can come from that because you're bringing veterans together too, most likely in these. And yeah, you know, you, there's that type of community there again, and the ability to, uh, really to have an imp impact on people's lives. You know, you mentioned suicide being one of the reasons uh, you lost a patron, and you know that you could have outreach programs involved. This easily, you know? yeah. Yeah, there would be an easy program to build, you know, PTSD, uh, trauma, and all that kind of thing. And using live action role playing as a catharsis to maybe deal with some of those demons and, and reunite um, ex-military people with that camaraderie that they're used to. And to make it a bona fide, authentic situation where, uh, again, they don't feel misunderstood or out of their elements or 
um, just not prepared with a civilian life. They have a place where they can immerse themselves back into the lifestyle that they're used to. Uh, I do have plans for a rather large enterprise coming up. Um, again, Brenda cringes when I talk about it, but it's the idea called the gauntlet. And the gauntlet is about a $3 million venture. And it's a combination of haunted house, live action role playing and escape rooms. And imagine this venue that you walk in and there's probably a tavern uh, that you come into and everybody that works in the tavern is in outfit and they are a character. They are sort of totally in role and you have a very typical bartender and barmaids and you have the guy that's sulking in the corner looking mysterious <laughs> and you have the rowdy bard up on the stage and you enter this scene much like a, a Dungeons and Dragons opening scene and you can sit and eat and drink and leave or you can eat and drink and interact with the people around you and you start realizing there's this politic happening. There's these events happening. There's all sorts of uh, intrigue and, and mystery and relationships and you can get involved in all of that. Yeah, like you become part of the play in a way, you know, totally that. Yes, that's exactly right. The play is happening around you and you can insert yourself if you want. If you insert yourself, you are coached to go talk to this mysterious guy in the corner, like the, the Aragorn figure, you know, with the brooding hood and he's smoking a pipe or something. Hmm. And this guy reveals to you that the kingdom is in need of adventurers or there's something amiss and they need somebody to go do this thing, right? The quest. Call and he said, yes, totally that. And he would be your guide. And you, you sort of buy a ticket and you get escorted by this guide into the, the castle keep, like this very large edifice that you walk in through these big double doors, sort of like Aragorn in Lord of the Rings when he opens up those double doors and he comes striding in. It's that mm -hmm. whole scene. And then in the courtyard that you walk into, there are different pavilions, and each pavilion is in charge of equipping you in the manner of the role that you're going to assume in your adventuring party. So you have a pavilion for the rogue and a pavilion for the fighter and a pavilion for the cleric, and you get to choose what pavilion you go to, and you get suited up in armor. And you're given a sort of a live action role playing weapon. It's like this foam weapon. And the whole time the page or the squire that is suiting you up is telling you what your role is and what your responsibility is and sort of how you're supposed to see this adventure coming forth and what you're supposed to do and uh, your role in the party. After you get suited up, everyone then conjoins back together and you go on the adventure. And the adventure is probably five or six huge rooms that are joined, but each room is its own setting and within that room it sort of becomes almost like a um an escape room where there's things that you have to find and some puzzles you have to solve and there's people you have to talk to to get information and sometimes there's some kind of monster or some bad thing that you actually have to fight much like a haunted house and in haunted houses you're not allowed to touch the monster this would be the opposite. You're totally expected to go smash this monster down to the ground and, and you know, kill it. And maybe it's going to give you some information if you do, or maybe there's something on its body that you find that is the answer to some questions. But you go from one scene into another scene, and you do this about five or six times until you get to the big boss at the end of the adventure. And if you make the choices along your adventure the right way, then the boss reacts to you and you can sort of successfully complete the quest. But if you're making bad decisions along the way, you actually end the quest as a, a failure and you have to sort of huh. do the walk of shame back to the tavern of, of not doing it right. But it would be this very living kind of um, building yeah. where you become part of that whole drama. We're all as a stage. We're just the actors totally in it. Totally that. That's yeah. exactly right. Just uh, getting rid of the real world. And of course, you could start buying your own suits of armor that we would sell there so that you wouldn't even have to rent from us. You could you could have your own. 
and you could become a somebody and uh it would just be this living communally driven adventure you could have people returning maybe when they complete a quest they get a level they get some kind of exactly right yeah and they come and they that makes them want to come back yeah and then if they really are diehard and they do this a lot they would probably be incorporated into the lore and the history and the adventure and they'd be you know referred to in uh hushed tones of awe and you know it's just some some joe that's sitting there some nerd <laughs> just living his life but we would refer to him as reverend lord Smith. <laughs> what's yeah. great about this is you're already building the community you know with your your dinners yeah. that you're having now these events is this uh, I seen this guy with this big scroll, you know, people's, I guess that was people's names, yeah. the invitation list. Uh, it's there just, it this, is. <laughs> there we there go. It wow. is. Very cool. All right. I'm going to, I want to, oh. I want to switch focus for a second. Uh, okay. Hold on. Before you okay, do that, yeah. I got a question from Mr. Porrick here. You've been asking all my questions. I got a question that's quite unique. So what what is, uh, Mr. Porrick, like, what is your roadmap for creating these, like, amazing fantasy ideas? Like, are, are you, is there, like, reading material? Like, it sounds very Joseph Campbell, Power of Myth, Carol with uh, a Thousand. Yeah, yeah. Thousand Faces of a Hero. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm schooled in the literature tradition. Uh, that was what I got my master's is was in literature. So I, I certainly understand the power of the story mm. and the universal draw to the story. Pen is mightier so, than the sword, so to speak. It, absolutely. It changes mm-hmm. worlds. It creates mm-hmm. worlds. It destroys worlds. Mm. Um, so Perhaps. almost everything I do, there is a narrative at work. Even the board games that I'm making, um, I showed the, the graphic of some of the components of my board game right uh there's a narrative to that there's characters that develop and you know the rise and fall of the moral story and all that kind of stuff so Mm. i I think that's what permeates a lot of the things that i do um and at the root of my story is my personal value system Mm -hmm. and almost every single business decision that brenda and i make it's totally derivative of the value system that we hold as individuals And that's another thing that makes me think that Nightwatch Games is unique in that um, I don't see a lot of those values being displayed in the industry um, on on the level that Brenda and I do it. What are those values? It's a good question. Um, I think when I joined the Army, they were able to articulate the values that I had in this nice, pithy little um, layout that there's leadership, Leadership is the acronym for it, but it's loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, personal courage, honor, and integrity. I I think that's it. Yeah. And those are universal things. You know, I don't have to really try to. No, you live your life. That's how you live it. I mean, it's it's a lifestyle change. It's just like when people talk about going on diets and stuff. I, I like I do intermittent fasting. It's a lifestyle change. It's not a diet. It's something that I can continue to do, just like you can with your, you know, leadership uh, acronym. Yep. And it, it pervades everything that I do, and the business decisions, and the future plans that we have are really derivative of how can I encourage the community that's rallying around me to live that kind of life that's full of duty and honor and integrity and courage you know Mm. it's very knight-like it's it's very almost archaic in its chivalry Mm. uh take the sexism out and then i think that's what you have as night watch games is a very chivalric kind of approach to living a warrior's life in the best way you can right Uh, people are responding to it pretty well i really like how you're using that value system but like through larping you're turning the concept uh into reality through imitation and i absolutely love that yeah i think if you fake living patterns they yeah. become real you know right. they become, they muscle become habits memory. yeah right. and even even my role-playing games when i'm sitting around a table and i'm playing dungeons and dragons with my friends instead of playing a very silly version of dungeons and dragons i like playing a game that's full of those moral quandaries 
boundaries mm -hmm. where you have to make the tough choice. Right. And I think that's what a hero is, is a person that takes that tough road and um, at even at their own personal suffering, they elevates and heighten the lives of those around them. Amazing. Thank you for answering my question. That's I love that. <laughs> I, I love the question. So Porik, we've been talking a lot about business and your um I guess we could call it your uh if I can get my words out here, philosophy, you know? Uh um, I agree with that. Yep. What about uh, self-help? What do you do? Because not all these answers, I mean, we're all human and we don't, we, we have to kind of put our feelers out, so to speak. What kind of self-help do you get involved in? What kind of stuff do you do uh, in your personal life outside of uh, your business to keep you on track and keep you motivated? Um, it's, it's interesting that you asked this question because I, I've had to re- uh, engage my self-help mechanisms. Um, I'm now 52. I'm coming on 52 and I'm having that midlife existential crisis of, um, I'm getting older. My body's, you know, getting, uh, stiff and less flexible and less strong. And <laughs> I, I am visiting all that kind of stuff. And, um, I, I really had to ask myself those questions is what, what am I doing? Am I doing enough? And the answer was I was uh, doing a lot for the people around me and for my wife. Um, and yet I found that as an individual, I, there was a couple of areas where I was not developing and that was the physicality. I was sort of just getting old and fat and weak. And I thought yeah. oh, I got to do something about this. Um, so comically, I've picked up my BMX bike again. <laughs> and like I said, I'm 52. I used to do trick riding back when I was 20. Uh, so 30 years ago, I was run, rolling around and jumping and spinning and doing all these tricks back in the day. Uh, but life got in the way and I had to put the bike away. Well, I've picked it back up. And there's that saying that you never forget to learn how to ride your bike. Well, that is BS. Let me tell you, <laughs> you forget, you forget. So I, I picked up the bike again and I'm reacquainting myself with what it is to balance and to face the fears of doing things that, you know, might result in injury. Um, but it's also spurred this social need of, of going out and doing things that are fun with people. Uh, I've also bought a mountain bike, so I'm hitting the trails with people and we're going through the San Antonio woods and and just pedaling it up and sweating our butts off. There's that sense of community again. Yeah, I, I find that I, I really do need to be connected to people. It gives me context. It gives me motivation. Uh, I get inspired by other people. And of course, I get happy by causing happiness. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of if I am making people laugh, I, I'm probably laughing myself, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm wearing my 1980s Vans shoes and I'm uh, doing BMX tricks and um, I, I'm sort of documenting this because I think a lot of my friends are in the same, same position of getting old and uh, we're fighting the idea of, of shuffling off into this, you know, this nighttime death. No, I feel you. Hey, as someone that actually does know how to work out and build muscle, uh, I can tell you that's the best way to stave off old age. It's if you can, you can retain your muscle longer in life. If you start working out now, you agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, because we can't, we're here for a short amount of time and it's no escaping that. No. So we talk about legacy and what kind of legacy we want to leave behind. What's the legacy you'd like to leave behind? Uh, that's a good question. Brendan and I were asking, um, you know, if we were to die, what would happen to the store? Are we going to put that in a will and give it to one of our employees? Uh, we don't have any children, so we can't pass it through that. Um, 
So th that's a big question of what would happen with Nightwatch games. But um, I think my legacy and Brenda's legacy are so tied together that we'd really want to be remembered for empowering people to pursue their happiness. And whether that be through games mm. or live action role playing or all sorts of other community activities or individual activities is really give people the means and the encouragement to pursue happiness. And when I say happiness, I'm not talking about daily distractions or, uh, you know, the, the good taste of food or a good movie or something. I'm talking about the very profound state of being satisfied with your growth as a human being on this earth for the limited time that we have and being content with what you're doing with that time. And um, I think that's where the happiness comes from. But as you guys know, it's a struggle. Every day you're either struggling or you're dying. That, that's the mm. choice. You either grow mm. or you die uh, and growth is painful. So I really want to be remembered for helping people grow, uh, encouraging people to grow and supporting that kind of growth again, within kind of a moral framework that I agree with. I think we can grow pretty bad too. Um, so you really just propose people living their best life and being happy from it. Do you have any, uh, any questions you'd like to ask Turtle? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, my mic cut out there. Um, no, I think I'm quite... You, you asked a lot of my questions that I've prepared, uh, <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> and none, but nonetheless, uh, Mr. Pork, it was a pleasure listening to you. Like I learned so much. I have like three pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Cool. So tell me about the podcast. Is this episode one or what, what do you guys have planned for the podcast? Yeah. So uh, this is, I, w I would call this official episode one. The first one was me and Turtle just got together as a proof of concept um, I, yeah. you know, put it together in two days. We're like, I, I'm a firm believer and you learn by doing. So mm -hmm. I was just like, screw it. Let's do this. We're doing, we're going to do the podcast Wednesday. And being that I'm really, uh, my skills are technical based. Uh, I have 3d printers, you know, I, I've, um, I do war gaming. Uh, I paint m models. I, I sculpt them. I'm, I'm into uh, karaoke. Um, I, I just I like to do a lot of things with technology, and I already knew that I would like. I had this. I had it figured out in a couple of days on video editing and uh, how to get all the sound to come in proper. Uh, and and a lot of the stuff is done with just free software. You know, I mean, they it's actually it's almost encouraged for people to, you know, make their own content. Um, yep. but I would say this is officially episode one and I already do have a couple other guests that I'm have interested in, in doing the podcast. Excellent. I'm going to tell you about one of them. Okay. So one okay. of them is a buddy of mine. He's a prior, um, army veteran and he has seen combat a few times. Uh, this is, uh, I always joke with him. I'd say, I tell him he looks like a baby gorilla cause he's a big dude, but what's funny <laughs> where I met him, he, uh, I was uh, working at St. Vincent Infirmary in an IT p profession, and he came on board. And I was surprised. I was kind of thrown off. I was like, wow, this guy. But he, he really surprised me. He's very intelligent. And not that I didn't think he was anyway, but you just don't get that. When you look at him, you're like, this is, looks like a dangerous person. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. But he's really smart, very sweet guy. And so we go from combat veteran to IT to now a painter and he's actually really good at painting. Uh, I think a lot of, you know, I don't want to speak for him, but some, maybe some PTSD related stuff. He's been able to pour this into his art and it's, it's really amazing. Uh, but yeah, I plan on having him on. Uh, he may be my next guest. He did show an cool. interest and he is going to have some of his art displayed in an exhibit in Florida. And some of his art on Instagram has really blown up too. We're talking like twenty thousand plus likes and stuff. Yeah, know, excellent. Like, oh, good for him. Yeah, that's cool. 
you know, but, uh, pursuing happiness. I love it. Yeah. I mean, what we're only here for a short amount of time, right? Uh, I will tell you as for someone that was hurt for a couple of years, uh, actually hurt my back improper lifting techniques, guys don't have your butt out too far when you're squatting. All right. <laughs> okay. You want to have that back in alignment. Uh, I do blame a little bit on my childhood. Uh, I started working with my dad when I was 11 years old, laying carpet, tile and vinyl and, uh, he wasn't the best for me uh, on my back. You know, it's not the best thing to be doing when you're that young. But needless to say, I learned a lot of good values. Uh, uh, you know, work being one of them. Uh, I would say now that I'm not hurt anymore, I had surgery about three months ago. It's amazing what they can do now. I have a, I had it done in Texas, by the way. I had a my lower disc in my back replaced with a prosthetic that actually no no oh, pins, wow. no screws. It, it, it's, there's a flange on the top and the bottom that meets directly with my vertebrae top and bottom. And I have a new disc in my back. And after only three months, I'm running, I'm back in the gym again. You know, it's amazing. Wow. And, and my, cool. my outlook on life, even like I'm actually, so a part of this podcast was because I'm bored, you know, like I have all these 3d mm -hmm. printers, I have stuff that I'm interested in, but because I have ADD, I kind of bounce around, you know, on stuff. I like switching it up. And, uh, I guess probably my passion is the technology and learning new things in technology, but, uh, and, and turtle, are you the more, um, abstract of the two? Are you the ideas guy? I would say so. I think you muted turtle. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Turtle. My, I don't know what's up with my mic. <laughs> Uh, I would say we naturally, I would be abstract in regards to kind of like the podcast and how things are going. We're super fresh, like uh, Sinesh has mentioned, this is kind of like episode one. So kind of getting a feel for what our strengths and weaknesses are, but like uh, where it comes down to just kind of like in my daily life, I'd say I'm pretty more on the abstract side of things. There's a uh, speaker by the name of Gary Vaynerchuk. He's an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. rags to riches kind of guy, and he gives a lot of inspirational talks about pursuing your dream and and living your life and all that kind of stuff and he talks about whenever you have a venture that you're creating that you should have two elements covered one is what he calls the dirt and um it sounds like justin that's you yeah you're the technical dirt operations guy mm -hmm. and then there's a second component called the clouds and that is the large abstract framework in the vision and the the sort of the mission statement and what the future looks like. And he says, if you have those two components, your venture is going to be probably more successful than if you just only had one of the two. So the fact that mm. you have two of you, I was just wondering what, sort of what the roles were between the two of you. Oh, I agree. Podcast. Yeah. So what I'd want to do, I th I feel if this can continue and here's my idea, I think that you build podcast views and, uh, uh, subscribers by having interesting people on that already have a following, you know, I'm of course going to share your links in the YouTube. And if you could also share on your Facebook page, Oh, absolutely. The podcast yeah. link. Um, I, I think, love it. I think that's how you build viewers, um, and community. And I think that eventually I would like to be more into video editing and making it more interesting and adding sounds and, you know, like, and really just trying to focus more on research and figuring out the kind of questions I want to ask people and then have turtle be more the voice in a way, because I just think he's, uh, he's for one, he's interesting as hell to talk to. Uh, let's, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, and I, and one thing I like about turtle is he's always very positive. And, uh, when he asks you about your day, he really cares, you know? Yeah. Um, authentic. Yeah. I and, try. Yeah. <laughs> And it's hard when you're dealing with your own stuff, you know, everybody has their own things. Sure. And, but again, I think in the end, all we have is each other, you know? Yep. Well, as Gary Vaynerchuk would say, jab, 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 right hook. Uh, so giving value to the people around you. And then when you need that favor, you know, you've cultivated those relationships where there is somebody there that's going to give you their time as well. So sounds like you guys are doing it right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Cool.
All right. Well, hey, um, I guess that ends the podcast. You gentlemen have a great rest of your evening and uh, be safe out there. And hey, I, I plan on making a trip out to Texas really soon. I wouldn't mind stopping in and checking out the store. Oh, I'd love to see you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, be Same sure to, here. Yeah, you guys are very welcomed. Uh, if any of your listeners are looking for more information, they can reach out. Um, our email is owners at nightwatchgames.com. And that's night with a K, K N I G H T, watchgames.com. And then, of course, we have our Facebook feed and our uh, Facebook community called Night Watchers. And then uh, there's also the URL for the sanctuary. But if you find Night Watch Games, you'll find the sanctuary right next to it. Okay. Uh, cool. I'll have all these links in there uh, in the description. Really appreciate it, guys. Love it. Sure. Great. Thanks for having me, guys. Take care. See ya. Happiness. Yeah.